to tell us something. When we talk about precision, what do we mean by that? Anybody can unmute and talk. We are discussing. Today's facilitation is not like maybe giving a lecture. So at a point, I'll stop. We will discuss and move on. And if you have any questions, <clears throat> sorry, you can drop your questions. So participants, what is precision? Can anybody try? If you don't try, we are not moving on. <laughs> so yes, you have to, this is, you see, don't, over here, there's nothing called wrong answer. No, you can just say something and then everything is okay. So don't think that probably I'm going to get it wrong and people will love nobody. You know, there's nothing like wrong answer. Everything is right. Just say something and yeah, so that we know. It's just a discussion, feel free. So what is precision? Or oh, everybody's qualitative, uh, maybe uh, we, more of you are qualitative people. I, I don't want to believe that. Because Ibrahim, I think that at the time you asked a question on, uh, con, uh, it was quantitative question. Ibrahim, am I, am I not? Haven't you asked me a question before? It's Abraham, if, sorry, Abraham. Are you with us, Abraham? Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yes. Good morning, Abraham. <laughs> yes. Um, being precise, uh, to my knowledge, I think uh, he's talking about you being accurate, like you are telling us that in your study, like we have a different precision rate where you are looking at your study. And that one, you are the researcher, you have to determine how precise you're going to be in your study in saying that um, the, uh, your sample size uh, is a true representative of your study population. How precise you're going to tell us that? Yes. So, uh, to me, very good, Abraham. Yes, you've said something. That is a precision level that you have to gauge. There's only one element that probably I have to say it up so that in person, uh, precision is not the same as the uh, represent the representativeness. But the sample size, as you said, is what matters so much because it's your sample size that determines whether your study is going to be precise or not. And so what do we mean? The power of your study is about your sample size. And that is all systematic, uh, the meta-analysis is going to do. Meta-analysis doesn't tell us anything about the quality of the study, the validity of the study, apart from the precision of it. Because what? We try as much as possible to bring a lot of study together to improve the numbers. That's a sample that you will need to power the study to determine the difference or the effect as small as it may be. That is all meta-analysis is doing. Are you with me on the same page, all of you? Yes, please. That is why normally when you are reporting systematic review and meta-analysis, if you find that somebody is writing something that the title is the title dot, 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 meta-analysis, then it means it did not go through the systematic review process. And therefore, the likelihood that the estimate would have been biased cannot be ascertained. But if it is systematic review and meta-analysis, then it has gone through the systematic review part. And then when it goes to it got to that synthesis part, let me go back and to see. So you have this is the systematic review process one two three you have to go through all this this is the level at which you are combining so meta analysis this is the only level that meta analysis is coming in so if you do not go through all these things and you just combine the data it means you don't have anything to gauge how or what would have influenced your uh, estimate you wouldn't have any um 
gauge, let, let me, let me, so to speak, anything to monitor or to, to find out whether your estimate would have been maybe influenced or not. And that is why normally, even to do a meta-analysis, you have to go through the systematic review process to formulate a question, develop a protocol, uh, uh, search all uh, databases, and even including an electronic databases for all the data, include them without missing anything. And that is what we are talking about. So we are not just talking about meta-analysis, but it's interesting, most statisticians just pull data. They do the meta-analysis and present it. You can get beautiful graphs, you can get beautiful forest plots, but as to whether those beautiful uh, forest plots are valid or not, we can tell. So, so the ability to answer questions not posed by individual studies, that is also one of the advantages of meta-analysis. You are able to pool. So now you are looking at the aggregate, aggregate finding. You want to put, bring everything together to now give a common statement. And that is one of the um, advantages of meta-analysis. Because that other time too, I told you, the independent studies, each of them might mislead. And normally we see, I use one of the forest plots to show you that where all clinical trials which were, were conducted misled. So if you were to use evidence from any of the independent studies, you might have been misled. But we, when uh, meta-analysis was uh, done by pooling, combining the studies, we had an estimate that clearly showed that. Although the evidence, the estimate, the difference in the estimate was small, it was beneficial, and it was only a meta-analysis meta -analysis that was able to detect that small um, effect difference. And then the third one, the opportunity to settle controversies around, arising from conflicting claims. Normally, when you do studies and you don't pull, you are unlikely, it is very difficult to be able to settle controversies. But if you are able to pull together, being able to move apples from oranges and synthesizes either apples alone or oranges alone, which are so similar to uh, studies that are similar, you will be able to address conflicting issues. So it is very important. Now, however, they also have the potential to mislead seriously. And why is this so? Particularly, if specific study designs within study biases, variation across studies and reporting biases are not carefully considered. And that is what I have told you. If you do uh, just the meta-analysis without considering the systematic review, that is what you end up with. But if you do the systematic review and add the meta-analysis, then these issues will be addressed. Therefore, it is important to be, to be familiar with a type of data that is dichotomous continuous and outcome in an individual study and to choose suitable effect measures for comparing intervention groups. So that is what we are saying is that even the data, you may have the data already there, that's fine. You should, you, you should be able to pull, that is fine, without considering some of these things, the nature of your data and the nature, the type of the outcome and choose appropriately, you are going to model up at that stage. So it is also very important to understand the nature of data. So now, let me, normally when the people are doing systematic meta-analysis, they won't bring this one in, but as I tell them, as beginners, some of you are beginners, and some of you also would help in all epidemiological studies, I have crafted this one in to be able to take you through the type of data that you will come across. Because all that you're doing is systematic review or pool studies. These studies have been designed, the primary studies have been designed with the specific study design type in mind. It could be a case control study. It could be a focus group uh, discussion. A focus group, yes, it could be a cohort study. It could be a randomized control trial. You have to understand the type of study and what goes into it before analyzing your data. So as the nature of the outcome. 
So now let me take you through the outcome data that you're going to come across as you combine studies or as you do systematic review, especially in the area of the epidemiological study designs. So many people will tell you data can be grouped into what quantitative, qualitative, and so many things. I'm over here just saying it in an authoritative way that the day two forms of data will be encountered. And if you can, if you consider that we have only two forms of data, it saves you a lot. And then yes, from some of the things, the, the, the discrepancy, the, some of the issues that will come across as you do systematic review. We have two forms of data, dichotomous or binary, and then continuous data. What is dichotomous or binary outcome? It's the, it is that outcome which says that the outcome either happens or it doesn't happen. So either yes or no. An individual can only be in one state at a time, example, dead or alive. This is what we call dichotomous and then or binary. Let us take the uh, continuous outcome. In continuous outcomes, um, these are all outcome data that are measured. So it is now becoming simple. If any data that is measured on a scale is a continuous outcome. So which are some of the data that are made? So if you go to, you are doing a study that involve anthropometry, all the things that you are measuring, all the, uh, the, uh, the outcomes or the variables that you are measuring are continuous data. So height, weight, uh, all other things. The, the biceps, the, 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 its diameter, and the and fat deposit, all the things, even BP, and anything that you measure is continuous. So now the forms of data uh, have been simplified over here for you. We have dichotomous or binary, and we have continuous. So, but sometimes the continuous, for example, age, as I said from the beginning, you have age zero to maybe the last person who is maybe 100 and maybe six or something. And if you want to do analysis around them, sometimes it's difficult. So you may want to now categorize the data, which we call the categories, and then code them to so that you can transform the continuous data into categorical. But normally, they are not true categorical data. But so to speak, epidemiologically, we can accept that. So you categorize 0 to 5 is one age group, another 6 to 10. These are categories that I'm talking about so that you analyze, we can compare the categories if needed. If not needed, just use the continuous data assets. So now we are talking about effect measures. What I talked about uh, just over here as the type of data, outcome data that you're going to consider in your systematic review. But over here, I'm talking about effect measures. So what are the effect measures that we will come across? Normally, what you come across is risk ratio. Most of you know that normally the relative risk, you say, oh, there's, there's a, this relative risk is equal to zero point this or one point this and that with confidence interval. This is mostly recommended. Why is this so we'll get around it? And then we also have the OS ratios or sometimes the a petal OS ratio. The petal OS ratio is normally not commonly used, but in systematic reviews, sometimes used if you have very rare outcomes. And then you have the risk difference. These are all dichotomous effect measures. So over here, the dichotomous outcome, which has been defined simply as uh, being in one state at a time, yes or no dead or alive, we have so many effect measures that are used to describe dichotomous outcomes. When we come to continuous outcomes, the continuous outcomes are many. Anything that is measured, weight, BP, cholesterol level, whatever, whatever time, a lot of things, all the variables that we're going to be dealing with, most of them will be continuous. But you look over here, the effect measure that is used is the common mean. That is mean difference. So you're finding the mean between, the difference between two means that group A and group two, but otherwise it's just the mean. And then when it uses the same scheme, but in some cases you will have these different scales that are used to measure the same thing. So in that case, you 
call something the standardized mean different, that is what you would use. I will tell you what the standardized mean difference is as we move along. But if any time you have any questions, you can drop your, your, you can raise your hand or just unmute and shout so that I can address your questions. Let's move on. So still dichotomous or binary outcomes. Over here, sick or not sick, child or adult. Let me use this one as an example. So first, we are seeing that over here, risk ratio or relative risk. Before you can determine relative risk, you have to determine the risk before relative risk. So what is risk? Risk is number with event over the total number of people, which is probability of event. Take note of this, the probability of event. That is risk. And then risk is reported between zero. That is no risk at all and one. Certain, uh, certainty or certainly risk will occur. Else, that is probability of event occurring. But take note of something that's happened over here. When you look at risk over here, the total number of people would, is the denominator. But over here, it is not the total number of people. This is not a not a sample size, but rather what the probability of event not occurring. And we're going to talk about that. So P over one minus P. So over here, if you have 100, it means that over here will be uh, 100 minus the event over here. That is the event, the sample size minus the event over here. I'm going to talk about that. So don't, don't get confused over here. So, so over here, you can see there's difference between uh, risk and then us. But we are not talking about us ratios yet. So these are something that I've, I've already touched about, so you can read about them when, when you get the notes. I've already explained. Let's use an example to go through the outcomes that you are going to, or the outcomes that are reported in most of the literature that we're going to combine to uh, in our systematic reviews. So risk of being killed. Not, and then we are using this one, Prasgontel, as an example. Prasgontel is a drug which is used for treating schistosomiasis. So number cured by Prasgontel as the numerator over total number of people treated. So if you treat 100, you want to find how many of them were cured. And this will be the top over here. And how many of them, the number you treated will be over here, which will represent your sample. And this is the denominator. So example, how often is a patient cured out of the total sample? So the number of cured, uh, the, the, key, the number cured over the total sample treated. But when you come to us, us of being cured, number cured by Prasgontel, the numerators are the same over here, number not cured by the Prasgontel. Sorry, I should have changed this one. This one is also Prasgontel. So the, how do we the, define it? That's how often is a patient cured compared to how often they are not cured with trazoquantel. So now we are moving on. I said that before you can compute relative risk or odds ratios, you have to first of all compute a uh, compute odds, and also have to compute risk. So now we are moving into uh, the ratios, comparing intervention A and B. The A is the intervention and B is the control. Let's see how we compute the uh, relative uh, the measures. Risk ratio, all these ones are relative measures. We are coming to another thing. Let me, let me just quickly say this one before. I said that a true outcome measures uh, dichotomous and continuous. But we have, we, there are two outcome data, data uh, dichotomous, which is binary and continuous. Then we move on to the outcome measures. And we, we talked about really uh, risk ratio, odds ratios, and all those things. But when you come here under the binary, we will also have relative measures and then absolute measures under binary outcomes. So that is what we are going through. You will find which ones are relative and which ones are absolute measures. So risk ratio is a relative measure, odds ratio is a relative measure, and relative risk reduction 
these are relative measures. Why are we saying they are relative uh, measures? They're over here too. I pause one minute. Participants, yes, I want to hear from you. It's so simple as we come in over. So why are we saying that these are relative measures? Henry, do you want to talk? Yes, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for participants. Why are we saying make it interesting? Isn't this is don't be afraid. This is statistics. Most, most people fear statistics, but this is statistics made easy. That is it. So I'm trying to bring the fundamentals, not the, the calculus and those difficult ones. Those ones the computers will do for you. But these are the basics. This one, if you understand the, these ones I'm talking about, you don't have any problem with whatever complex statistics some people will be talking about, the modeling and other things. All of them, as we go on, you see that they are generated from this because they are going to come from just the two by two table, no matter how complex they are. So I want to take you to the basis so that next time when you're analyzing your data, you can help the statistician to analyze it the way you want it. Otherwise, they will analyze it the way they want it. And sometimes they can model up, they can, the subgroup effect and all those things can model up, especially if you don't get those who really understand these simple issues. So it's, it's, a, it's a something I want us all to be feel free and to just go through them. So I'm waiting for the answer. Why are they relative? Why do we say they are relative measures? It's so simple. I'm waiting. Oh, nobody is talking. Yeah, if you have challenges with your internet, you can put it in the chat. Yes, in that case. yes, that will that will help. Yes. And I'll have to take some one or two before I move on. Otherwise, I'm not moving on. Okay. Okay, that, that's probably this is an assignment for all of us to go and then yes, we, we just research on why we call these measures relative measures. I'm not going to give the answer, but it's so simple. So I've given to you participants as a homework, something that when you go back, you just have to look at why we call these relative measures. Then let's move on to absolute measures. So we have risk difference. Why or absolute risk reduction? Why do you call them uh, absolute measures? And the number needed to treat something that you're going to find at that time are also, when we're talking about assessing quality of, um, of uh, studies, I mentioned the number needed to treat as one which is you to deal with attrition, attrition by others is lost to follow up. And then this is very important. And then I told you about what uh, the number needed to treat is all about over here. If you want to find the number needed to treat, it's just the inverse of one. Yes, the inverse of risk difference. So one over risk difference will give you the number needed to treat. So if you want to find the risk uh, number needed to treat, you have to calculate the risk difference first. So what is the risk difference? And over here, we're also talking about absolute risk reduction. So. Let me just say that this one is over. For example, if you are talking about intervention and non, uh, intervention and control group, that is the risk in A, the intervention minus the risk in B. So that is what we call the risk difference or the absolute risk reduction. And that one will come. That one. Um, relative measures. These are the re relative risk or the relative. This one, the RR stand for relative risk or risk ratio, they are the same. So if somebody uses a uh, risk ratio, it is the same as the relative risk. Please don't be confused. And the OR is always the OS ratio. These are the most commonly used, but we are saying that normally they are reported on a low scale because most of this uh, the analysis that we do in systematic review, when we come to the meta analysis, we don't compute them by ourselves, by using maybe the calculator or something. We put in a in a in a in a in a software. 
the data analysis software like the Revman, like the Stata and other things. Normally within the Stata, the programmers have programmed it in such a way that when you put these uh, measures in risk ratio and odds ratio, they would calculate it on the basis of the log form of it, the logarithmic scale. Why is this so? Why? Why do we have to uh, do the log form of it in the analysis? Why? This is a question. I'm coming out with simple, simple questions. Uh, and these are, please make it interesting. Answer, try and attempt and make some yeah, contribution. Why do we have to? report them on a log scale. Why? Over here too, I'm waiting, so pause. Otherwise, so I'm going to, yes. So I'm Adam. waiting for some answers. Is there a hand up? Adam has uh, unmuted, maybe. Okay. Oh, okay. Adam, can Sorry. we hear you? Sorry, no, that was not a hand up. I think I just joined, but I, I forgot to mute my mic. So. so probably that will be your welcoming package. So just once you just ask, have, have, you, done, have you done some statistics before? Uh, yeah, I have done a bit, but uh, I'm, I don't think I'm not that proficient, so I'm just learning. I've been doing a lot of qualitative work, but oh. um, for, uh, I have a PhD paper which is uh, a quantitative, so okay, I hope to so, learn one or two things. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't want to embarrass you, okay? Otherwise, I was going to welcome you with this question why do we report a, a relative risk or risk ratio and odds ratio on a low scale? Anybody can, can anybody tell us? This is really a lecture, not teaching, so. Okay, shall I also give it as something? No, I won't do that because otherwise there'll be so many of them. The reason what we, are, what we do that is that, as I said, data can be grouped into two, continuous and then binary. But normally the data that we have may not be normally distributed because all the fact or the, this in statistics we normally interpret our data on the basis of the normal distribution if your data uh, does not follow the normal distribution you can use the normality assumption to interpret your data so normally what you have to do is that you have to transform the data so the log logarithmic transformation is the one that we can normally come across. Even when we get when you go to the mean, you can see that the mean is normally, if it's not, we just log it so that we can have the log form of it, have the geometric mean instead of the arithmetic mean, but they are all mean. So let me talk about this is the log scale. So let's move on transformation. So now interpreting the effect measures, this one is just how do we, I'm just keeping this one in, but you will have a, a chance of doing a real interpretation. So relative risk and odds ratio, we say that when the value is equal to one, it means that there is no difference between the two groups. Why is it so? You are now, we are not talking about risk and we are saying relative risk and then odds ratio. We are not talking about only the odds. We are talking about the odds ratio or the relative risk. And we're saying that when the value is equal to one, it means there's no difference between the two groups. In other words, the intervention and the control, there's no difference between them. Why is this so? Participants, I'm waiting. Why is this so? I myself, I'm not a statistician, so don't be frightened by this. I'm not a statistician, but it is just that to be able to now move along with most of this uh, uh, reporting, you have to sometimes I encourage, even if you, even if you're a qualitative person, try to mm, do a little bit of the quantitative. I think the basic ones like this. I urge you, please. So, Adam, from now, please, I'll, I'll encourage you. It's not too late. Yes, uh, I'll hurt you, sir. I actually was thinking about why we transform the log. I, I had it, but then I couldn't say it. So yeah, 
Thank you. <laughs> it says, so this will just all boil down to fear. You fear that probably you're going to get it wrong and no. Over here, the platform, I've said it, nobody gets anything wrong here, except that if it is really acutely, uh, it has deviated acutely, then I'll set it and say, okay, probably this one. Otherwise, everything is, you are, you are, everybody is right over here. But I will normally give the final answer so that by what I give, you can take what the meaning is from what I say finally. We are not going to criticize anybody. We probably the best we can do is to critique. Over here to nobody has said anything. Should I move on? Bring it back to me, just statistics or just common uh, mathematics. Why are we saying that when you get one is equal to one, the answer is one. It means there's no difference between the two. Why is it so? Bring it to com common mathematics, not statistics, mathematics. And then let me also help you with, starting from now we are compare, um, I was talking about the relative measures. I said this relative measures what? Look at it, we divide A by B. And let's assume that A is intervention. We are dividing by B, which is the control. And we are saying that when you divide and you get one, it means that there's no difference between the two. Why are we saying so? The answer has been given, but why are we saying so? Oh, please. Hello. Yes, uh, Martin. I just want to try. Maybe I, it means that maybe there's no association between the two. Yes, you've said something, Martin. Yes, probably. But this one, I say there's nobody wrong over here. So, yes, the final answer will come. Martin has said something which is interesting, saying probably there is no association between the two. But is it right or is it right? We don't know. So let's move on. When the value is greater than one, then the outcome is positive. But normally it depends on the outcome that we are estimating. Why is it also so? You are doing relative risk or risk ratio. And you say when you get the answer risk ratio greater than one, oh, it is positive. Why is it so? And then if it's less than one, it's negative. But we say that it also depends on the outcome. Let me go quickly and then because we have, I think we had all the time so that we can take our time to now go through because I know most of you, some of you are beginners in systematic review and even some epidemiological studies. So over here, if you go back, I said that you are dividing two. When you get a number, when you do, when you divide a number and then you get uh, one, it means that the, the top, the numerator is the same as the denominator. So the effect in the intervention over here, the effect in the intervention is the same as the effect in the in the in the uh, the the control. That is why you get one over here. So anytime you have a relative risk and it is equal to one. It means that there's no difference between the control and then the intervention. That is all that it tells us. And over here, why is it? Because you are dividing the intervention by the control. When, you, when do you get a positive value? When the denominator is what smaller than this. So it means that the effect in the intervention is bigger than the effect in the, in the, in the control. That is when you get a positive value. So that is, it's so simple. But over here, I'm saying that it depends on the outcome. Is it so? Do we take it that all oh, when you whenever you're dealing with risk ratio, relative risk, or odds ratio to get one that you take it that it is positive outcome? Sometimes, no, it depends on the outcome. Let's take your rate and failure rate as an example. Failure rate and kill rate they are the same. So, if for example, you are treating and you get 90 people cured, how many of them are not cured? So you, if the total sample is 100, you have 90% kill rate, isn't it? But because 90% are killed. And then if you have uh, 10 of them, 10 people not killed, you, how many, what will, be your fail, what will be your failure rate? Failure rate is 10 over 100. So they are the same, just that they are talking about different things altogether. When you are dealing with kill rate, and the outcome is more than one, then it is good because you're looking at a favorable outcome. But when you are, the outcome is failure rate. And if you get a positive value, 
does it give you something to be uh, happy about? Or does it give you something to be happy with? No, because it means that more of those in the intervention group are failing than even the control. So the intervention group that you, the treatment of, uh, the treatment um, that you are now assessing is not better than the control, even uh, on the other way around, the control is better than the intervention. So it depends on the outcome over here. But when you, the outcomes that are, for example, positive cure rate, maybe, and even when you are dealing with headache, for example, when you're able to reduce headache, it the out, it's better than when the headache is uh, or se uh, severe. So that one too, when you have it greater than one, and the outcome is one, the outcome is headache, it's not favorable. So it depends on the outcome. Otherwise, most of the interventions that we deal, we'll be dealing with when the number is positive, uh, or more than one, then we consider it as having a positive outcome. Now we are talking about intervention, sorry, about, for example, treatment. So when it is lower than, less than one, the same meaning applies, so let me jump on. Relative risk reduction is the percent risk reduced by intervention. Risk difference is this, this risk difference is what percentage risk reduced by the intervention, taking into consideration underlying risk in the population. Number needed to treat, number of patients you would need to treat to prevent one event. For example, now the COVID is all that we know COVID-19. So vaccination is supposed to prevent so if you treat maybe 100 people and you are able to prevent um, 90 people from getting the, the infection, what would you say? Would you say the treatment is, is, is good or not? Yes, the treatment is good because, and this is what the vaccine people have measured. I guess they are talking about how many people cases will be prevented. So when you tell us, talk about the efficacy of 85 or 80, 90, they are talking about how many uh, cases can be prevented. Because these people do not have the disease, you are giving to them to prevent the disease. As opposed to when the disease is there and you give a treatment, that one you are prevent, you are seeing how many of them will be cured from the disease they have contracted. So these are different things. Uh, we will talk about them later on. And that even when you are talking about screening and all those diagnoses, they mean different things altogether. If we have an opportunity to talk about diagnostic uh, test accuracy, then we will talk about the difference between diagnosis and screening. So let's move on. So risk ratio versus odds ratio. Now, we have talked about this before. So let's go to, let's go to this example. I'm using this one as an example for you. So, Look at the two by two table I said. Normally it is over here. We don't consider the total over here, but we have put it over here so that you know. And sometimes we can also add another rule down here to add all of them, the 90 and 20 to give the totals under. And then this 100 and this, but we can add this, the 100 and this, we can add it. So let's look at this two by two table. This is the intervention. We are considering transcontinental for the treatment of schistosomiasis and placebo. Um, we gave a treatment to 100 people who had the disease and at the end of follow-up, maybe the follow-up was one month, 90 of them were cured. As against 10 of them who were not cured, the total sample was 100. And then now look at the placebo because we are assuming that this is prasgontel is a new drug. Normally, if you compare with a placebo, it means that it's an intervention that is coming up. We don't really know the actual efficacy yet. So we are not certain. That is when we first try in placebo to see it before later on comparing with other standard treatment if there's some if they are available. So the placebo too has some cure. 20 people, participants in the placebo group were cured as against 80% that were not cured. Over here to the sample size is 100. So over here, the question is calculate the probability of cure with prasicontel. Probability of cure with prasicontel. And then probability, the second one, probability of cure in the placebo arm. And then 
The second, the third one is calculate the relative risk or the risk ratio. And then how do you interpret your findings? So let me give you uh, two minutes. This one, I want everybody to calculate and share in the, in the chat uh, platform. So on the basis of what we have done so far, this is so simple. So we want to calculate the, the probability of cure with presbyteral, and then we want to calculate the probability of cure in the placebo arm. And over here, calculate the uh, risk ratio. Everybody should try. From the examples I've given so far, and it's so simple, I, I can tell you so simple. So moderator, take it over and then, so when they are done, let me know and then, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So I will give them three minutes. Okay, so we have additional additional three minutes. No, just in total, uh, not five, uh, three minutes. So probably they okay. have two more minutes to finish up. It's so simple. So they have already about two minutes to finish up. Please let's start putting our answers in the chat. Okay, so we have one. Uh, I'll hold on to this answer whilst we wait for more. Okay. Mm. Okay. Two answers now. Okay. A minute to go. Okay, so and time is up. Do we okay. need extra time for to finish our calculation? I think you have to move on. You have a lot to cover. So the notes okay. will be given to them, the slides will be given to them. So if two or three have been able to, yeah. Okay. Can they show us what the, the final, the answers they got? Just uh, somebody can unmute and just shout, I got this number one, that is first bullet, second bullet, and the third bullet. This is what I got for, just that. Okay, okay. so Martin, if you want to go first. Can yeah. unmute and, yeah. Hello. Hello. Hello, Martin. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, I need to present my answers? No, just, just say, what did you get for uh, the oh. first one? Probability oh, of first one, with... The first one, I got uh, 0 0.9. Good. And the second one? Second one, 0 0.2. Good. And the uh, third one, 4.5. 4 4.5. Yeah. Good. So the next person, the one who, also uh, the one who sent his or her answers through, can you unmute and let us know?
Can you tell us what you got? So, same as uh, Mark and Action. Please, oh, so, uh, sorry, we can't sorry, hear you. This is Levina. S sorry? This is Levina. Oh, Levina, yeah. Yeah. So what did you get for one, two, and three? Not bullet one, two, three. Did you get the same answers? So one, same, yeah. You got the same, same answers? Answer. Okay, then good. So now let me go, let's go on and then they will tell us how they did it. But now look at it, wait for you, the answers are here. So Martin and Livina, thank you. You got the first one as 0 0.9, the second two, the probability of uh, cure 0 0.2, and then the uh, this one, the probability of cure, that is so the relative risk is equal to this, 4.5. Very good, and it tells us that the answer is really um, good. So over here, why didn't I use relative risk but used uh, probability of cure? I intentionally used that because I told you that beforehand that risk is the probability. It's a risk is the probability. So when you, if you, I can't go back, but if I should go back out, let me just quickly. Normally, that is what I do. It takes a lot of time, but I think I should do that. I said risk is uh, over here. That is the number with event over this, which is risk is what probability of event. So that is why over here I could have said calculate the risk, but I didn't do that. I wanted you to understand that probability of event is the same as risk, but you use the same um, approach. So now this is what you got. The simple answer, this is the two by two table, 90 over what? 100 and then over here 20 over 100 that's all and then when you get the answers you divide this one the first one by the second one this is 90 over 100 divided by so all this one will be the numerator 90 over 100 will be the numerator and there's a line over here then 20 over 100 will be the denominator so it is like let me use where i have the proper line over here the 20 over 80 over 100 will be all under here. And then the 90 over 100 will be on top over here. That is what you should do. And it's so simple. So thank you for those who contributed. And let me emphasize that. The, 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 the report that people will do, the SPSS and those in reporting risk ratios or relative risk that you don't know how it was done, and then you see 2.5 relative risk is 2.5. All of them had been framed around this two by two table. So if you understand the two by two table, no matter how difficult that uh, the, 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 the statistics is, you should be able to figure out what is going on. And then I've also told you about the log transformation. You log it to make it the norm, to follow the normal distribution so that you can interpret it on that basis. So let's move on. Let's take this one also for, normally we said that us and then risk are the ones that will come across often. And then when it comes to relative measures, I said that the relative measures are the relative risk or the risk ratio and the us ratios. So we've talked about them. So now let's talk about us ratio. How do you calculate us ratio? First, you have to calculate the us of the us in the uh, intervention arm and the us in the control arm and then now you calculate the ratio because it's a relative risk. So over here, try this one too, as you did over here, and I, over here to three minutes for you to calculate your, uh, yes, uh, do the calculation, three minutes. So moderator, back to you. Give, uh, please, give them three minutes for this uh, assignment, exercise. Okay, thank you. So please do put your answers in the chat uh, as done previously.
a minute to go. Please do put in your answers in the chat. We do not have any answer in the chat yet. Mm. Uh, wow. we need, no. Okay, no, so we do now from Abraham. Okay. Well, I think, well, so time is up. Um, okay. So yeah. let, yes, let's go. Uh, is is it only Abraham? And then Martin. Martin, okay. So can they call out the numbers they got, the answers they got? Abraham, um, can you uh, Yes, it? please. Yes, please. Um for the odds of care, um I got the same 0 0.9. Which is uh, cured upon the total number of cured ninety upon hundred. Um, for the odds of a placebo, um, I got the same zero point two, and then those two figures ninety upon hundred, um, all upon twenty upon hundred, will give me my odds ratio for kill, okay. which is a four point five. Okay. So this one you got 4.5, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. okay. So who else? <coughs> Martin. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think uh, uh, for question one and two, I think uh, I was not sure of how I should do it, but uh, for question three uh, on the calculation of odds ratio, uh, I had to do a cross multiplication of uh, of uh, figures on the two by two table, okay. so I got uh, uh, thirty six, which means that uh, uh, thirty six percent of uh, of uh, people who can be uh, treated uh, can be cured with uh, with the drug. Okay, so your final answer for the odds ratio was what? Thirty six. 36, isn't it? Yes. Good. So now we are going, we are moving forward to see, and I see that these are some of the small, small things that really, particularly those coming from Africa, probably we need to spend a lot of time. We have taken these things for granted. And if we don't build the foundation, the basis, probably we will, we will find it difficult to <clears throat> compete in maybe in research. I see anywhere that. We've talked about these simple, simple things and understanding, especially epidemiological study design, big simple issues are so <clears throat> not well formed. And I think we have to now, I'm also learning a lot. So probably in the next few, maybe months or years, we have to begin to also come out with some of these packages, simplified way of <clears throat> helping us to understand issues. So now let me, go for it to find the answers. So these are the answers. And why did I get that? So uh, Abraham, look at the, you see your denominator was what uh, just yet uh, betrayed you. You see, over here, you still made it over 100. Why did you make it 100? And then yes, I said that when you go, let's go back. Normally I want to refer, we are not in a rush. So let me go back, back. And then when I get it, I will, I will, I will come back and then when I started with it, I said that over here, odds of being cured is equal to number cured by the intervention, which is now the presbyteral, over number not cured by the uh, 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 presbyteral. I said this one should be changed to the presbyteral. This is it. So the number cured, 
and over the number not killed. And I told you that if you have 100 and 90 of them is killed, 90 of them are killed, then automatic, uh, by default, 10 of them are not killed. So 10 will be the denominator instead of the sample, which is used uh, for uh, calculating risk or risk ratio or relative risk. In risk ratio or relative risk, you have to use the sample as your denominator, but in us, no, the number without event will be your denominator. That's also, let's go back and see this over here. And then so, odds of cure in the placebo over here, 20, uh, 20 over what? Over 80, over here is 90 plus gondels, 90 over 10. And then 90 over 10, you get nine and 20 over 80, you, you get 0 0.25. And then so odds ratios is, all oh, this one, the odds in the intervention, <clears throat> sorry, the odds in the intervention divided by the odds in the uh, control, that is the placebo. And this is what you get. So 90 over 10, all of them divided by 20 over 80 and you get 36. So now let's look at the, the over here. The, this one, the same numbers, the number killed and over here, they are the same. Look at it, we've got 4.5. We use the same table, this 90, 10, 20, 80. And then now we are getting different results. Why is this so? Why is this so? And this one has been over here, has been explained for you over here. Relative risk or risk ratio and odds ratio differ simply because of how common the outcome is. So, or how common the event, that particular event is. So now we are dealing with cure. That is how common are people, that is what we will talk about. So odds and relative risks are close only when event risk or the event that I, the event of interest is rare. When we have rare, why is this so? Look at it. Over here, 90 killed, and then we were left with only 10% that were not killed. So when you divide this by that, then by all means, because the denominator is small, it is going to exaggerate this. That is why we look at it. It has exaggerated our findings. So you have to understand the data that you are dealing with and use the appropriate effect measures to represent them. Otherwise, even when you have done everything right and when you are analyzing, you will get something to model up over there. Because look at this one is getting 36. And look at the risk ratio is giving us 4.5. Way, 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 way different. And why is this so? So this is what, when we are doing meta-analysis, these are the uh, things that you come across in primary studies or even the meta-analysis. But we are now going to move into the meta-analysis proper. This is why at a point you will be asked to select one. Is it odds ratio or relative risk? you should know when to select odds ratios and when to select uh, risk ratio. When events risks are common, the best one to use will be the risk ratio. And then when you have rare outcome, you use um, odds ratio. Why is this so? Why is this so? Let's move on. And then risk ratio and odds ratio come would approximate each other when the outcome is rare. Why is this so? Well, this is just some post uh, mathematics. Over here, we have to tell number 100 and we have number 100. So if cure rate, for example, those who were cured were just small, five, pe five people were cured. Over here, you have number not cured will be 95. And then over here, if placebo, you have even two uh, people not cured. You over here, you'll get 98 people, two people cured. you get 98 people not cured over here. So because you subtract it from 100. So when you are dealing with the, when you are talking about odds ratio, your de, uh, denominator over here will be 95 and over here will be 98. They are not far from 100. As against uh, risk ratio, let me take it again. Probably this, I find it to be simple, but even the way I'm explaining now, just, I don't know. That's why I'm, I'm even uh, stressing myself in trying to explain this one. Risk ratios use the total numbers, the sample. All ratios use the numbers without event as their denominators. This is ratios who use this as their denominators. 
cost ratio to use this as their denominators. One of the days, normally when people, those who have followed public health and some epidemiological, uh, maybe some health causes, health related causes, they will tell you that when you are calculating all species, you draw diagonal over here, this over that, or this, so I don't even know, having used this, so I don't know, we just draw diagonal over there and divide. How do you do that? And you may get it wrong. The simplest way of doing this, understand the number of cases as against the number, the total number treated, and then do it. What about if I change over here and bring number not killed over here and bring the number killed over here and swap? Do you think when you cross in all ratios, you get the same thing? No. So don't ever cross. This is the simplistic way that people use it without understanding the basics. Just understand the basics that all is the number killed over number not killed. Pass risk is number killed over the total sample. And use that when you want to find a ratio, you just divide that of the intervention by that of the control and you get your um, ratio, the relative measure, which is odds ratio or risk ratio. Let's move on. There's, there's another thing that you will come across. This is risk reduction. I gave the formula over there, but you haven't got the slice yet. So I don't think some of you, well, most of you remember. And I talked about risk reduction over here, how you calculate it and then number needed to treat. Over here, I'm not asking you to calculate it. We are just moving straight forward. This is still two by two table, the same number killed, the same number not killed. Let's go and see how we calculate this. How do we do it? Risk, uh, relative risk. Before you calculate the risk, relative risk reduction, you have to calculate the re relative risk. Or uh, you uh, listen. So over here, we the uh, relative risk or the risk ratio, we got this value as uh, 4.5, and then us ratio we got 36. So if you are you want to compute relative risk reduction, just one minus the value, the relative risk. I said is one minus RR. So RR is the relative risk. So we just subtract the a relative risk from one, and then you get this. Now we are having negative over here. Why are we getting negative over here? And does the negative, uh, um, what, what that, is, it, is it? Is it useful? It means this one, I'm just using this one, for example, as headache. What that it tells us that treatment reduces the risk of no cure by 3, 70, uh, 350%. Don't let's talk about it for now. I'm going to, uh, later on, We'll talk about how to interpret the findings. But if you want to calculate relative risk reduction, calculate your uh, relative risk and subtract it from one. One is a constant, so that's how we do it. And then the interpretation is there. Why do we use even relative risk reduction, but not just settle on the risk uh, reduction to risk ratio? You have to, it's an assignment for you. The number needed to treat, I mentioned the number needed to treat is the number of people you treat to have a desire, one desired outcome. And that one, you can't just calculate the number needed to treat, you have to calculate from relative, uh, the risk difference. So what is the risk difference? I gave you uh, the, the, the formula for risk differences, the, for the risk in A minus the risk in B. So if you are talking about the intervention, the intervention risk in the intervention minus the uh, risk in the control. In this case, the risk, what do you get for the risk in intervention? Let's go back, back, back over here. This is the risk in the intervention, which is 0 0.9. And the, that is the risk in the placebo, 0 0.2. These are the one that you see, we subtract the 0 0.2 from 0 0.9, if that is what this. Yes, or you subtract all this one from that and you get this 0 0.79. It's just like 0 0.2 subtracting from 0 0.9. The number needed to treat now, I said if you want to calculate it, just the inverse of uh, uh, the risk difference. So the risk difference is this 0 0.7, just one over the risk difference will give you 1.43. What does it tell us that? It indicates that you would have to treat 1.43 people to achieve or to get one person a cured. That's what does it tell you? 
And if you like round this one to uh, uh, round it up into a, a whole number, it means that when you treat just over one, you get one. We don't treat two people to get one uh, of them cured. You treat just over one and you get one of them uh, cured. And you can even look from this data over here don't, without using this. Sometimes I said, I always say, there are some uh, data source that you don't have to worry yourself to go through all the kind of things that you need to do to present this in all ratio as uh, maybe also as relative risk. You can just look at the numbers. Over here, I can see that transgontal works. It, it, it is very effective because if I treat 100 and I get 90 people cured, why should I go through all ratios and all those things? And even getting the interpretation wrong, I would look at the absolute numbers and make sense of it and move on. So, but if you want to, especially when you are dealing with large data and there are some of the things that you can take into consideration when you are analyzing, when you use your, uh, that you look at the values like this. There are other things that the statistical software, the software will take into consideration. That is why we move further to this risk ratio and all ratios and all those things to analyze or to uh, come out with the final value. So over here, number needed to treat two tells us that the treatment is very good. So now let's move on. I said, we have continuous, I just want to finish this one quickly so that we can have our, uh, some time for the next one, which will be for the hands-on activity. The continuous outcomes uh, will be this one measured on the scale. I've talked about all these things. We have the Walmart scale. We have the SHSF36 scale. We have the Likert, normally those who work in the pain area. Those are some of them you have to, because they are subjective. We have to now assess how people are feeling about their pain. So we have a whole lot of things for them to take. And these are the ones that you come across. These are all measured, apart from the centimeters and kilo, kilograms and dosing. These are serum, BP, serum, cholesterol, and BP, and temperatures. Everything that is measured is continuous outcome. I've said it, and it's, if you take it like this, it makes it simple, uh, become so simple for us. Let's move on. And the mean, normally they are assessed using mean, and I talked about it. The mean without anything is called the arithmetic mean, which is, but when you have uh, transformed it into the law form, you, be, you come, you become the uh, geometric mean. I'm, 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 I think I have to slow down Russian. It becomes geometric mean. And over here, you when you report mean, Normally, you describe it by the standard deviation. Why is it so? We, there are two standard things that you come across. You have the standard error and the standard deviation. Why am I saying that you have to describe your mean by the, the uh, standard deviation to show the, the variability around your mean rather than the standard error? Why is it so? Why do we use standard deviation rather than the standard error? That one to I just want to somebody to say something. If you have the answer, please unmute and just uh, say, why do we use standard deviation rather than standard error over here? To describe the variability around our sample. Let me put it this way so that to describe the variability around our sample. Why is it? Why not standard error? Let me check this one around. Normally, when I'm certain questions, when the kind of the things I do, I have something called the principles and the concept. Normally, that one will form about 40%. And these are simple, simple things. But it normally I find that these are the difficult, that is what most people get muddled up. And so, yes, because these are simple, because if you don't understand the simple, the concept and then the principles, what, even if you get, you are able to calculate the things, how would you go into interpreting it? How would you figure out that something is wrong or not? So normally, and this is what I'm, I'm saying to this morning, we have to now, begin to immerse ourselves in some of these issues, the little things, concepts and principles, and then assumptions, 
around what we do. And if you have this, if you master this, can you not be found wanted? So, so now, um, Adam, I think you want to talk. Uh, uh, could you repeat the question again? Adam, I'm saying that over here, I'm saying that normally when you are reporting a mean, and I'm saying that mean is the effect measure used when your data is continuous. And I first of all, I said that continuous outcome data, I use the R or any of them, continuous outcome data is data that is measured on a scale. So anything that you have measured, you have used a meter or a scale like the weighing scale, or maybe the laboratory analysis that we do, cholesterol level, and even checking your BP, anything that you, you use a scale to measure is a continuous data. The data we generate from that is coming from a continuous uh, 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 data. And then, yes, and I'm saying over here, when you are reporting continuous data, normally mean is what is used. That is the effect measure used to uh, present continuous data. And even before, when I started, I said that, although the dichotomous or the binary outcome, it's only just one thing, either this or that. We have so many effect measures that are used to represent or report them. That is the risk ratio, the OS ratio, the peto OS ratio, the relative, the risk, different, all those kind of things. And I said that the mean or the continuous data, which has a lot of uh, dimensions, normally is reported by one just factor or one measure, which makes it so simple for us. And I'm saying that when you have now assessed or aggregated data, in a sample, and then you want to represent the mean, normally there will be um, a function, a factor that will describe the variability around your mean. And we have two of them. One is standard deviation and one is standard error. And I'm saying that in this, when we conduct a study and use sample, why do we use standard deviation rather than standard error? So Adam, I think, uh, explain myself is it is it or you still have i explained yes, myself yeah. well yes i've heard uh, so now i'm expecting you to also to give me this answer adam so my, um i don't know if i'm correct but my thinking is that don't be uh, afraid please don't yes, the, sta yes. the standard error yeah will um perhaps may be more useful when um uh, uh, showing the confidence um, of uh, the precision of the estimate yeah. or precision of the estimate. Yeah. And um, I think then the mean uh, will give, uh, yeah, I think the, the, that for me is my understanding of the difference. So I think good. the standard, yeah. yeah. You said something good. Yeah, because of time, this kind of things, normally we should get time to now, because this is not something that we should run through, because these are fundamental, basic, and we should get time to now have discussions like this and move on so that we know where we are, so that we know where we can, we can uh, do. So thank you, Adam, for saying that one, but the, the reason what we do this one is that, the two, normally when you, are, you want to get the estimate of intervention, or anything that if you're doing a study, if it's an intervention or non-intervention study, and then you want to get a true estimate, then you would have to get or include everybody, the source population who would have been included if you had the opportunity to include everybody on the planet covered by the study that you are doing, which is always, always not possible. For example, if you want to talk about malaria, those maybe malaria, those who are cured by this, maybe some malaria treatment. The best way to find the efficacy or the true effect of the treatment would be to treat everybody across the, the endemic areas, those where malaria, the areas that malaria is endemic to find out, to give a treatment to everybody and to analyze and to find how many of them were cured or not. But is this, is it possible? 
for us as research scientists to do that, operationally not possible, practically not possible. And that is why normally when we are doing a study, and if it is a quantitative, we try to define a specific group within the source population. The source population is all those that would have malaria or uh, that is a population with malaria who would have the opportunity to get the treatment. But because it is not possible, we try to sample, and I'm bringing that representativeness because normally people talk about representativeness as an issue. Presentat uh, representativeness is not an issue at all, just to make sure that you get the right sample, which is as similar as your source population, that is all. And then you take sample, for example, um, now it's global, I don't know where you are coming from, but where you are joined in this uh, particular webinar. In your country, you won't include everybody. Even in the city, you will include everybody. Even the rural section, probably we would include everybody, but you will select only a few, up to 200 or 300 or maximum 500 to include. But those people who should have benefited will be in the millions. Because it is not possible, we try as much as possible to use the sample to describe what would have happened if we had used the overall the, the population, which is not possible. And that's why representativeness comes in, but that is not what I'm talking about now. The true population mean, which we don't know and which we can never find, which is like an abstract is described by what we call what this, uh, the, the, this the variability around it is the standard error, a standard error. And then the sample, which you have really sample and you can work on because the sample that you are dealing with as the population, the participants, you can collect data yourself, you can interact, you have hands on. Those, the sample is what, uh, the variability around that sample is what we call the standard deviation. And the reason I'm saying that is this, when you are doing a meta-analysis, always because you are going to include primary studies, independent primary studies, each of them should be described by a standard deviation rather than the standard error. Some of them make a mistake and do that. And you say that we see them doing the standard error. When it, that happens, it means that people don't understand what they are doing. The standard error is the variability around the true population, mean, which you don't know and you can't find. But what you know and what you can do is the sample. And that is what the mean that is coming from the sample, which is the X bar, is described by the standard deviation, which is the SD. And then the mean that we don't know in the natural population, the true population mean is always represented by the mu. Those who are those who know statistics, the mu. And the eight uh, variability is what we call the standard error. I've spent a lot of time over here, so let's move on. And if sometimes if your data, the mean, if your data are skewed, you can use range and you can use the interquartile range, and that to that one, you can just report them like that for skewed. Otherwise, you can also do the, uh, the transformation by using the logarithmic uh, uh, transform way to um, get it to the normal distribution. Let me go for because yeah, I think you'll be running behind time. The mean is the sum of values over the total values. It's so simple. It's just like the mean that we talk about. So if you want to talk about mean difference, mean difference is mean of A minus mean of B. This is when you are measuring the same thing with the same scale. But when you are measuring the same outcome, but the scales differ, like they like it. You have the like it, five, like it, 10, like it, 100. All of them, you're measuring the same thing. Then you have to do something which you call standardized uh, mean difference. So the, standard, the, the standardized mean difference is just the mean of A minus mean of B as you get for the mean difference. Only over here, you divide by the overall standard deviation, overall standard deviation. So let's move on. And this is a standard, uh, mean, standardized mean difference are not affected by the measurement units. And this one here, no, let me, it's becoming too complex. So now let me talk this and then now we move on to the practical session, which will be taken up by one of uh, a, a certain a, a gentleman who will be introduced to you, David Uredu, to take you to the practical session and then yeah you come back and then
So the power of meta analysis has already been talked about. I use some example to talk about this is it. But over here, I want to um, rest over here for him to start with uh, the practical part of it. And then I'll come back and take you through the interpretation. So David, if you are there, David happens, David as a, a has a, a NPH is a, has finished a Master of Public Health and he's involved in the systematic reviews that I do. Actually, uh, David Happen, I supervised David when he was a student. And since then, David has been working with me and has done, I've asked him to do a lot of things for me. He, he he's now, uh, he's very good in, in systematic reviews. So I will ask him, David, if you, I'll take my distance down, you share your uh, slides and take them through what you have for us. Thank you. So moderator, uh, Dr. Kudria, um, now I'll just uh, stop sharing my slide and then David would continue. But you would think we need to have maybe five minutes of break. You know? Yes, so I, that is why my hand is up. Oh, your hand is up, I haven't seen it yet. Yes, no problem. Okay. And I sent a, a text uh, earlier on, if we should have a break, yeah. Uh, before David comes on. So I think this is the right time to take yeah. a break. Yeah. Maybe 10 minutes for us to stretch our legs. Okay. Uh, go for our tea or coffee. And then yeah. we'll come back. Um, so it's um, 9.48. So we'll be back at 10. Is that 10. okay? Okay. 10. Yeah, 10. So that would be okay. 12 minutes. Yeah. yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So 10 Ghana Let's time because other people have joined from other countries. So 10 GMT, we're coming back 10 GMT. Those who yes, are so using different times, yeah. We, we, we shouldn't get confused on time. We are back in 12 minutes time. Exactly. Okay. That, yes. okay. See you soon. Right. Thank you. So. David, if you are still online, I think the people are, can we talk, can I talk behind, I'm, I'm, can we call and then have a one or two, share um, one or two, yeah. Yeah, sure, dog, I'm, I'm here. I'm in.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Still my. Hello. Hi. Hi, good morning. Morning. Yeah, so welcome back. Um, um, Tony, please, is David ready? Um, yes, so hi, good morning, I am ready. Okay, so please, um, right. you can start. Okay, um, good, good morning, everyone. And um, my name is David, as I have been introduced. Uh, before I start, I would like to um, thank um, Dr. Anton Daswapia so much for giving me the opportunity to, to take this part of the demonstration with how to, to conduct the meta analysis um, using the, the RevMan application. So I am trying to send a document to the chat session. Um, it basically is a Word document that has the, the flow of, of what we are going to do. Um, the network is a bit slow here on my end, but I think it will be there soon. <clears throat> but um, let me start sharing my screen so that we can we can get into it. Okay. So please, is my screen visible? No, yeah, it is coming. It's visible now. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, like I said, the, this demonstration will be on how to conduct a meta analysis, um, specifically forest plot, um, to develop or produce a forest plot using the, the review manager application, which we simply call the, the RevMan. So let me check if the, please check the chat. Um, the chat section to see if the web document has been uploaded yet so that you can all download and, and, and follow the steps. There is a lot of information in there that you will need as, as we proceed. Do you have the do you have the, the document now? I, I don't think it has been shared yet. Oh, okay. Let me try. Ah, okay. Stop sharing. Wow. Um doc, please. Um you try sharing it in the chat, uh, attaching it as a file. I, I don't know, it's taking too long to upload here on my end. Okay. It's a little over 600 kilobytes. I don't know why it's not. So you want me to open it from my side here? Um, no, no, it's actually been, yeah, it, it, it's showing now. It's fine. Yeah, Thank it's you. showing here. Yeah. Otherwise, you can use the one you have over there to take us through. You can yeah. share your distance with us and yeah. yeah. Yes, I can so find everyone, it here. Please download the web document I just sent here. Um, it has all the information and the steps as we are going to follow through. Is it, is it possible to share this document by email, please? Um, I can, can see it's there. 
You check he, the, he, uh, David is going to share his with us. He's going to go take us through, but this is something that he, if you, just in case you want to download your own, but he is going to take us through it. So the copy will be uh, made available to you later on if you want it. So, but he, he wanted to, uh, David, probably what you can do is that just share yours, share yours and take us through. And later on, you think about sharing or sending this one to participants. Everyone. Yeah, everyone. So that if they want to practice in, on their own. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Hello. 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 Hi. Hi. I'm Shala for ARK. So I was actually unable to download the thing. So will it be possible for you if you can share it through Google? Through Google. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that later. But yeah, um, for the time, yeah, I'm sharing my screen now. So I still have the files here, but maybe later I'll, I'll share that via email or either through Google Drive. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So please, I believe you can see my screen, right? Yeah, put it to full screen so that... Um, yeah, it's, it's my web document showing. It has meta analysis. Showing, yeah. Okay, good. So um, here goes. So the first step, we are going to download the Review Manager application. It's a, a computer-based application that has been developed by the Cochrane um, organization, you you find it to be a lot useful. But in this particular demonstration, we are going to be using it to generate um, forest plots. And then in later sessions, we'll talk about how to interpret the forest plot. So quickly, to download it, you just have to go to your browser. And then uh, you can just Google download, download Revman download Revman and, and just search it. Um, if you are following, you can select, please use the first link, which is Revman 5 download Cochrane training. Click on that link and then it will redirect you to, to the download page. So here, um, you have to select this for academic use. You are being asked, why do you need to use Revman 5? You just have to select for academic use and submit. So when the page loads, you have to put in some few details and then you'll be on your way to downloading it. So your name here is required. You can type in your name. I'm typing my name in the video radio. You can skip job role. It's not required. Academic affiliation. You can enter your affiliated university or workplace and then your email address so enter your email address as well you can skip the country part but you can also just enter your home country as well and then you take this boss which is basically you agreeing to the terms and conditions regarding the use of the revman application you can skip all these ones david, for now david yes, 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 yes. yeah this is the first time most of them will be using this revman so just okay. take your time and then yes, show them. Yes, okay. even if you get this one and you're unable to continue, you can reschedule uh, and continue this uh, because this is really packed. This okay. test is so take your time so that when they go back, they can do it. And participants, let me put uh, add this one. Rev, you see, when you're doing analysis, you will need a statistical software. The Cochrane collaboration has been pioneer pioneers in systematic reviews. But yes, are all on randomized control trials. And they developed this Revman, which is really user friendly and is very important. When we have another session that you'll be doing later on, how we uh, uh, how can we can write manuscript or prepare systematic review, we're going to use this Revman again. They have two components. The part that you can use to write everything from the background till analysis and uh, discussion. But this is the component that he is going to deal with. The meta-analysis is part of the Revman. So he is taking the meta-analysis part and showing you all that we are talking about. How do we generate a forest plot and how do we interpret it using this Revman? So that is the whole story. Sorry that we, this didn't probably come through. So David, take your time and let them follow you. Or, or, I think, yeah. 
Sure, Doug, thank you. So um, please, may I know if anyone is, uh, or everyone is tagging along, have you been able to navigate to the, to the download page as it's showing on my screen? Or please let me hear from you, anyone at all. Not yet. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Is anyone else following? Have you been able to get here to this page? Yeah. Okay. Well, if you are here, just fill in the information, your name, um, you can add your job role or, but the asterisk ones are the required ones. So your affiliated um, institution, your email address, which is important, and then your, your country. If you are done with that, you need to fill out here. Could you please give a short description of the work you, is, you expect to do with Revman? Here in this boss, uh, you want to type a short reason why you want to use Revman. So maybe you can type for use a academic training. and generating or on conducting meta analysis. So you can you can type that one in there. It's required. So you need to put in that reason. Any reason actually goes but for academic use or for your intended use that is. So after that you proceed to take in the um, their agreement, all right? And then um, you can actually skip it too. It's not actually required. It's, it's with the preferences. If you want to be contacted with emails on development and, and updates and all of that, all right? So if you are done with that, then you can submit the form. You can submit. I understand that some of us might be having internet challenges, so it will generally be slow loading on your part, but please try and follow as closely as possible. And of course, the session is being recorded, so later when it's shared with you, you can have, you can play it back and then have time to also follow through. All right. So this is the final download page where you select the, the appropriate installation um, um, file or model for Mac OS, you have to download from this from this column. So um, I am using Windows, so I will download from here. But also with the Windows, you need to download <coughs> the one that is for the Windows version you are you are you are running. If it's a sixty-four bit version or a thirty-two bit version, um, generally a lot of people are running on the sixty-four bit version. So I really hope to think we are all running that. So once you figured out, you just have to click download here and then the Revman file will start downloading to your computer. After which we'll go through the steps on how to install the application on your computer. Now the download might take a little while, depending on, it's not huge. It's a little less, I think it's not even up to 60 megabytes. Yes, it's 59 megabytes. It might take a little while to download depending on your internet connectivity or the speed of your network. But you want to download it, but I am going to pause and not download because I've already downloaded it. But I've uninstalled it so that I can go through the installation process with everyone. So let me <clears throat> allow some four to five minutes so that we can all download it. And if you are, if yours haven't downloaded after that, you can actually still wait and follow as we, we install so that later you can also do this by yourself. And again, the session is being recorded, so. So um, please, are you with me? Are you, um, have you been able to follow? 
Have you gotten to the download page? Uh, have you started downloading your file? Can we please give feedback to David? We can also use the chat. Yes, you yes. can also use Yes, David, we will, uh, I've downloaded it. I'm trying to install it. But... Oh, okay. That's great. Anyone else have been able to download? I've downloaded it and I'm trying to install it. Oh, okay. That's great. Anyone else? So that we can, it's just a little teeny bit of technicality with the installation. So I have two people that have downloaded and installing. So you install the Revman just as how you install any other application, actually. Um, it's not any different. You double click it, it's loading. When the install wizard comes up, that's, that's basically it. The only technical thing is just when it's done installing, you have to choose between two modes, which is the standard mode and then the non cochrane mode. And then you have to select the non cochrane mode there, but we'll get their version anyway. Like I said, I'm gonna be also installing, so you can see how the installation goes. So from here, you click next, agree, you accept the agreement, you go to next, next, um, you want to check this file and then option, sorry, go to next, next, and then that's it. We'll start installing. Anyone having challenges installing? Anyone else apart from the two participants that have been, sorry, I can't see your names yet. Okay, so you click finish to, to run, right? <clears throat> click finish to, to run the review manager application. So when it runs, you are faced with this option, usage mode. This is where I said you should choose the non cochrane mode, all right? The standard mode. Um, goes for the preparation of cochrane, um, or what we call intervention and reviews only. But choosing the non cochrane mode puts you, it gives you the opportunity to toggle between either. All right. But also, you can switch modes anytime. But for our use, we generally will be using the non cochrane mode. So you want to click this, and then the application will now fully open. So let me allow two minutes to see if I can get everyone. Please, I need. I need feedback, I need correspondence. Since this is a demonstration, we need to be in tandem so that um, you can follow well. So please maybe show by hands if you've been able to install, successfully install the review manager application and you have this window showing. Uh. So David, we have um, only one, okay, two participants now. Two participants, okay. Shia, okay, she has been able to do it. Yes. Adam has been okay. able to. Um, Katie, are you there? Zuma, Mwanza, um, yeah. Anyone else? Are you guys following anyway? Are you having challenges downloading the application or installing? Any challenges that I can address? Uh, I'm facing challenges in actually installing the software. The downloading okay. is done, but it's not getting installed in the system. Okay. Um, when you try installing, do you get any prompt? Is there any issue like, or so, it's just not installed? It's just saying that the review manager installer can't be open because it's from an unidentified developer. Maybe I should uh, yeah. have it from the that is uh, app store. That is your firewall working. So you have to allow it through. 
I am, but it's not working. Wow. I'm sure your fire all is on and it will generally block applications that are not coming from trusted websites or known websites. I'm sure. If you can turn your fire wall off or you can allow it, this particular setup to go through this one minute. One David, second, since you will be recording, please take yeah. yours because some of them will have an internet instability and not yeah. would be, yeah. they'll find it difficult downloading at this moment. But take them through the recorded version of sent will be um, sent to them and you also give them what you're going to use the template so they can follow through. Okay. Uh, use yours and we are all watching what you're doing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So this is the, should I say the landing page or the first page of the review manager application? I believe it's showing. Yes. Yes, it's okay. showing. Yes. So once you are here, <clears throat> you want to start. So this whole idea is to how to conduct meta analysis. And as uh, Dr. Danso already hinted, you can use the RevMan for so much more. You can actually use it to guide the preparation of a full-blown systematic review, whether a protocol or the full review itself. So here you want to click on create a new review, all right? And then this pop-up shows the new review wizard, all right? Here, you just have to click next. And then this is where you are asked, which type of review do you want to create, all right? Basically, we are going to be demonstrating with an intervention review. Um, intervention review is when you're looking into the effect or the outcomes of interventions, maybe just like how we just saw in the previous session, looking at the outcome with the use of praziquantel, all right? How many were cured, how many were not cured after you have randomized the treatment or you have um, incorporated the treatment. So we are going to do an intervention review. So you check this, it's the default check actually. So you go to nest here. Mm, how did you get the, that? Uh, could you start again? I think I've missed the part where you... No problem, no mm. problem. So the first, when you open the application, all right, you just have to click on create new review. When you click on create new review, this is where you get to, all right? So welcome to the new review wizard. Here, you go to Nest. And then you are just going to go to Nest because I'm saying this where you choose the type of review that you are going to do. And then we are going to do an intervention review, a part of an intervention review. So you click Nest from here, that's it. And we can skip the title for now, but this here can guide you to formulating your title. Where This is where you put the title for your review. So it could have been maybe um, efficacy of prazequanto in treating cystosomiasis here, but we are not going to be bothered by that here. You just go to next, all right? And then here, which stage should the review start in? Are you preparing a protocol or a full review? Um, basically, in the protocol, you wouldn't be conducting meta-analysis in there yet because that is where you have, you are documenting how you intend to conduct the, the review. But there's a full review, which means you have conducted the review or you're in the process of conducting the review itself and not the review. So click or select full review and then now click finish. Click finish. So finish will bring you here. Here on this page, all right? So once you are here, um, this is what I meant when I said um, the review manager can guide you through preparing a full blown review. So. These are all headings and places or placeholders that you can use from background to description of the condition to objectives, methods, all the headings that should go into a typical systematic review are here. So you just have to be filling in um, the details. For the purpose of this demonstration, um, that is conducting or producing a meta analysis um, uh, forest plots, you have to go to here. On the left pane, all right, I believe my pointer is showing. On the left pane, you will see right underneath tables, you see studies and references, studies and references. When you click that, when you click that, the page here on your right, the right pane is refreshed and then it will point you at that placeholder here. 
All right. Please, I hope you are following. When you click studies and references, you are here. All right. You want to click here under included studies. Right click. When you right click on our included studies, this option shows up and you want to click add study. So basically what we are doing here is that we are going to be adding the studies. So with the matic, you've done your search, you have screened the results, you have the studies that you are including in your review. So this is the point where you, you put in the references of the studies that you are including. So for this demonstration in the web document that I've shared, there is a list of these references in there. I'm just gonna be typing them in one after the other and show you how you get it done. So you just want to type the study ID. Study ID usually is the how you do intercitation. So it's basically the author name and then the year of publication. So the first one on the list is Down Kwan 2007, 2007. So once you've entered this, please click finish. Click finish. You go back to the same place, right? Just where you've added down, you see under included studies, the one we've entered now has showed up here. Click the same place again and add another study. So we are going to be adding a number of studies. I think we'll add about six studies in all. So the second one on the list is Emmett. Emmett 2. 2008. Again, you click finish. So you are going to repeat in this, all right? You click the same place, right click, add study. The next one here is Hangular. Nineteen ninety-two. You click finish. Go back to the same place, right click here. Again, include the studies, add study. Let's add the next one, which is and uh, for this time it is 1999. Is are you all with me? We go to finish. Yes, um, baby. And then again, we go that same place. So we are adding, basically adding the studies. The next one is Kans 1997. So we click finish. The next one is Le Shide. Le Shide. We click add study. Le Shide is 2002. Finish. We are not done yet. We'll add the next one. Add study, Le Shide. And we have pencil. Pencil is 2017, 2017, we finish. And the last one on the list, it's a fail. It's a fail, add steady, it's a fail. 2006, finish. So now we've added all the included studies. We have their references in the system, all right? So when you're done with that, go back to the left pane, all right? Where we click on studies and references. You go back here and then you click on the next option, which is the data and analysis. Click on data and analysis. And again, the page here will navigate, all right? And then bring that one up here. You can find data and analysis, the placeholder in the, uh, the review pane itself, the test of review pane here. So under here, we want to now add our comparison. So what are we comparing between the studies that we have entered? So we have six studies, I think it's seven studies. We are comparing a particular thing that they've reported. All right, so we have to come here. When you right click, you have to add comparison. So when you right click and you select add comparison, what is the name? of the comparison, what name should the comparison have? We want to compare side effects. We are comparing side effects that these studies reported. So you type in side effects and then just click next. So the next opens what we call the new comparison wizard, right? And it's asking you, what do you want to do after the wizard is closed? 
So when this result closed, what you want to do is that you want to add an outcome under the new comparison, all right? So which side effects are we talking about here, all right? So click on add an outcome under the new comparison and click on continue. So this is where all the things, or all the important things um, Dr. Danswa Pia talked about earlier comes to play, all right? So what's the data type that you have? Is it dichotomous? Is it continuous? Are you doing, um, are you doing variance checks? Are you doing generic inverse variance or whichever one, all right? So in our case, we are doing dichotomous because we are looking at whether a participant observed a particular, um, 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 what do you call it, a particular side effect or not. So it's whether it happened or did not happen. So it's a sort of dichotomous word, um, data here. So we go to next from here. And then what is the name of this outcome? You want to put headache, all right? So we are looking at participants of the study that, uh, um, that had headaches after taking the drug or the intervention or not taking it. That is the placebo group as well. So you enter headache and then you go to NEST. So NEST, this is where you are asked, which analysis method do you want to use? So there are a number of them. There's the PITO, there's the Manta Hansel, and there's the inverse variance, all right? We'll get into all of that later, but you want to select the inverse variance. And then what is the analysis model? Doug just talked about fixed effects and random effects. In our case, we are going to run a fixed effect analysis model. So you, you make sure that is checked. And then what is your effect measure? Are you going to compare odds or risk ratio or risk difference? And all of that has been explained in the earlier sessions. Here, we are concerned with odds ratio. What are the odds that somebody in the intervention group experienced headache compared to somebody, um, to the odds of somebody in the control group? or the placebo group having that same effect or head, all right? So odds ratio, that is what you select. And then you go to next. From here, it's just next, next. Here, you're looking at the confidence interval you want. Usually, it's set at 95, it's set at 95 um, percent um, in this case, all right? So here, you just want to also go to next, all right? And then um, next again. Now, um, on this page, uh, you are going to select <clears throat> add study data for the new outcome because we are now going to put or input the data, all right, for this outcome that we are talking about headache, right? We are now going to put in the data for how many people in the treatment group had headaches and how many in the control, they didn't like all of that data, all right? So you want to add study data for the new outcome. Remember, we have not added any data yet. All we did was to add the references of the included studies. We are now actually going to put in the data that was reported or that was reported by the studies that have been included. So check add study data for the new outcome and now click continue, all right? So here you are just asked which studies do you want to add data for, all right? So if you have gotten into this part, of the review where you're conducting meta analysis. It means you have already extracted data from the studies, all right? So we are going to put that data in, but we are considering all of these studies. And um, usually you can have a, a situation where not all studies included in your review will contribute data when it comes to the meta analysis. And this is the place where you would have selected studies that only have data for the particular outcome you are going to um, um, analyze. Right. In our case, they all have data. So you have to either click Control and A, which will highlight all of these studies, or you can hold down Control and select them one by one. So Control A will highlight all of it, and then you just click Finish. All right. So when you click Finish, this is basically a table pane, right, where we are going to put in the data, all right, that have been reported by the, the studies, all right. This place is adjustable. You can always drag to draw the graph page in view. You will see that you will find that as we start entering the data, the forest plot will start forming here, right? But you also want to have full access of the data you're entering. So you can also just drag to minimize the space here, all right? And then we can start keying our data, 
right? If you have the web document, if you scroll to the last part or the bottom, I put a table there where you have the studies and then their data, all right? It is arranged just as how it is asking it for here in this, um, in, in the RevMan application. So for the first one, which is Dunkwa 2007, under experimental, um, the, there were 16 events. So you type in 16, and then the total number of people or participants were 50. You go to control, you, you see that there were 19 events and the total was 41. We are going to repeat this for all of the studies. But for emit, they have 12 events and then the participants were 45 in the experimental group. And then under control, in the control, there were 24 and the participants were 45. And the Angular 1992, the events were 19 in the experimental, no, 19, 19. And then the total number of participants were 64. And in the control group, you had 26 events and then there were 41 people. In Angular 1999, we continue. We have 19, 45. We have 19, 40, 20, and 60. For cons, we have 19, 49 here. 28 and 63 for the side we have 22 let's see 22 and then 50 and then we have 20 here and 56 and enso for enso we have 14 events in 70 people participants in the experimental group and the control, we have 20 events out of 60 controls. And lastly, for SAFI, we had 18 events of headaches out of 66 people or participants. And then the controls, we have 27 events and out of 70 people. So, basically done you've entered the data and if you are looking here to the right you've have seen that the forest lot was forming whilst we were even entering the data so each line here and a dot represents the study and then the odds ratio all right but once you are done entering the data here you can click here on this icon which is the forest lot icon and then the forest lot will pull out nicely here you can actually enlarge it and see it much, uh, sorry. That's my card, let me do it again. And see it bigger, all right. My mouse is, so this is our forest plot. If you've been able to get here, congratulations, you have generated your first forest plot. So this is how it goes, all right. This is your forest plot. And as I was saying, each line here all right, where the dot, the square, corresponds to the odds ratio that was reported by a particular study. So this is the one for Dunkwa 2007. The odds are stated here with the 95% confidence interval. You have 0.54 odds. And then we'll get into the interpretation of first flows later, but this is how it actually goes. And then here, this large diamond here is what we call the pooled rate. So this is the pooled odds. Okay, when you are conducting a meta-analysis, this is actually what you are looking at for. You want to see the, the pooled effect or the pooled odds across all of the studies that you have included, all right? So here it's the resultant estimate that you are so interested in, all right? This one, and this is its corresponding value, which is 0 0.64, talking about the odds of headache, all right, in people, the experimental group compared to the people in the control group. So you can add 
the forest lot as a figure, or if you have a web document, a separate web document, where you are compiling your review, you can click here on save or on copy, all right? It will copy the, 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 this graph here, the forest plot with all the details as well. You can easily paste that in your web document. I hope my web document is showing. You can easily just, I've copied it so I can just paste it anywhere in my web document and it will show nicely. So I can just do copy and paste. All right, and this is it here. This is the first law where you can also consider editing, all right? If you want to save it as a picture, you can also do the same thing. You can click on save here. The dialog box will open and then you can choose which format, all right? You can just choose PNG, which usually works perfectly when you attach it in Word documents or even on the web page and all of that. And just have to select um, a location where you want to save the file to. And then, then that's, that's basically it. So this is how you, you conduct a meta analysis. All right, this is how you generate a forest plot. But the pain that we have seen, um, that is the, the boss we have seen, that's so much more than just showing the forest plot. You can actually also assess the publication bias or what we call the final plot also here, but we'll talk about that one later. Um, so this one here will tell you if there's publication bias in the estimates that you have regarding the studies that you have included in your, in your meta-analysis and all of that. There's so many other things here. If you had um, the shape of the data was different, you could also change the effects measure here from odds ratio to risk ratio, all right? But it will all depend on which effect measure you are interested in and all of those things. So I pause here to maybe take some questions or any clarifications and of course, the record, um, recorded version of this demonstration will be sent to you um, just as we are done. Then you can take your time and go through. But um, any questions, please? Uh, thank, thank you, you. Um, David. <laughs> so um, thank you for the presentation. And I have a question. Um, when sure. you um, enter in the, the name, so the Dankwa, uh, to yeah. 2007. I wanted to know if there's a way to just upload that name and not necessarily type in. And this is because if I have about 20 or 30 subgroups, it means I have to manually type in all these groups. Um, let me come in, David, over here. Um, ah, yes, uh, <clears throat> yes, that we see systematic review is so meticulous. And that is why with the packages that we use, normally we do not allow just copying and dumping it. So most of them we can't copy and even put. The reason is that if a mistake, an error has been committed somewhere and you copy and you paste, that, you have the, that oversight has already been lost. So we want you to do it always manually. Even if you have 100, you have to enter manually so that if anything happens, we don't repeat the same uh, mistake. So okay. uh, it's not that difficult because you, even the references, you can export references or import references, but not when entering the study uh, design. And it's not, it's not cutting corners over here. It's so meticulous that you have to find out whether whatever you have put in, you really did put in, not robust tech, not robot, not any automated, but you go through the systematic uh, process. So you would have to do it yourself. Thank you very much for the explanation. So the question wasn't to give the idea that you want to cut corners. It's oh, no, 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 no. Okay. Typing. You can yes. type and still make a mistake. Yes. So you know whether there's a way if you have 100, 200, but I, I get your answer. So you yes. have to be done manually. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And, and the likelihood that the same mistake will happen in the same area, the, maybe, for example, if you are typing the name and the name, uh, uh, unless you don't check and then you just made the same mistake is, is, is something that normally uh, doesn't happen often. And that is why normally duplicated, normally we do duplicates and other things to check this random error. So it is a way of, if a mistake has been uh, made somewhere, 
you also, yes. But let me also say that, yes, that is true. It's not for you. But most people do systematic review and want to cut corners. So I will still emphasize that not you per se, but that is what people do. They want to hurry up. One week we have done a systematic review and there is gone out and that is why they are making noise about that. That is not the, the, the best way we discourage that one. So it's painstaking. Cochrane reviews take over three, three years, even with improved methods. So, and then um, Campbell's collaboration to those who started the, uh, the real systematic review, they also take a lot of time. So I urge you, it's not going to be straightforward. And then sometimes we are not going to get it the way they probably you want to do it. The system will detect for you and then you have to follow through. Thank you. Do we have um, questions for David and Tony? This is a very interactive section. So please let's ask questions. Um. Hi, hello. It was a very, very uh, informative and well articulated presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I just have a small question. If I am uh, working on a topic that has actually addressed the research question through a qualitative study, how can I include that? The qualitative study include this meta analysis. How can I include that? David, do you want to try or should I come in? Um, no, please come in. I, I didn't get the question quite well. Yes, was... uh, she, she wants to find now. For example, this one has been used to generate this for a uh, forest plot for quantitative uh, analysis, like meta analysis. And she wants to find out if you are doing a, a, a qualitative synthesis. Yes, how can you go around it? Do you have to use the same thing? And the answer is no. This is, you see, that when we were doing meta-analysis, when I took that part, I said that systematic review can be qualitative or quantitative. And the qualitative one is either a narrative or something. So the way of packaging the qualitative synthesis is not by doing, you don't use that uh, um, approach. And that's why when I took you through the length of the stages that you have to go, when you get to the synthesis level, we have the, uh, qualitative and you have the quantitative. If it is qualitative, this is not the way to do it. You only have to present your results in tables and tests. So you create tables to present your results. You don't uh, put them together in a quantitative way like this because they are not going to use the odds ratios, the risk ratios, qualitative you don't. So you just report as is in a table. And after, after you have reported in a table, you have to find a way of putting together in categories and come out with final synthesized evidence. That is by pulling, inspecting. That one is done manually too. So it depends on your intuition and your understanding in the area to gauge. This is what all the uh, findings that have produced in the qualitative review are telling us to generate the final evidence. There are some softwares for the qualitative uh, way of doing a qualitative AP reviewer and other so many softwares are there. But this is purely for quantitative systematic review. Okay. Has your Thank question you. been answered? Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Any more questions for David and Tony? So without one waste, because we have about just 10 minutes to go, I just want to show you something quick and I probably I won't, I won't as, uh, explain them into detail. If there's time, probably you'll take it later on as a next session, because this one systematic review, the topics that we have taken, each of them, you can write volumes of it. So we have just given you the introductory part of it, but I have normally the ones that we have uh, done, we've made a bit, of much more detail than what other people will do. But still, even this one, the forest plot, you have to spend a lot of time to, it can take more than one hour to explain this forest plot as it is over here now. So take it as the basis and then let's build on. But if there's an opportunity and we are, <clears throat> we are doing advanced maybe courses, each of them will be taken one by one. 
the forest plot, uh, heterogeneity, uh, a lot of them, all the topics will be taken one by one to really expand. So whilst we're probably, D David, if you can, uh, the, if you can stop sharing and probably share the 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 the, cons, the the word thing that you use for them to get a picture of just run through quickly project it and then we take it down so that I can have the 10 minutes to share something with them maybe one or two minutes to show them something okay sure doc share the um, word document you use each of them are each of them is going to have it so don't worry so much you're going to have the word document which specifies stage by so what you need to do click here there's this and takes so, you through them yeah so this is the the word document the one i was trying to put in the chat but you also get it via email on google drive so there's the process that's the first step how to download the how to download the the revman all right, the review. You can you can just um, once you have the word document, you can actually just click on this link and it will take you straight to the download page without you having going to Google and all that. But of course, you have to also follow the steps that I iterated. You have to select for academic use, put in the details as are required, and then choose the version that is appropriate on the machine that you are running, whether Windows, Linux, or Mac OS. All right. And then, um, yeah, from there, uh, this is all about the installation. So the installation is pretty automatic after you've just double clicked. The rest is, the last one, like I said, is for you to choose between the uh, standard and non cream mode. You have to select the non cream mode, right? And then you are done. So there's the first or the landing page once you open the review manager application. This is why I said you create, you click on create new review, and then you proceed to go through the, the steps. The steps are also here. These are the references you were adding. So the studies, Dankwan, the meds, and the rest are tabulated here. And again, the steps are here. What you should do, all right, stepwise from all being captured here. And then with the, creating the forest plot proper, these are the steps too. What you have to click on the left screen, the right screen, the name you are inputting, which is the side effect, what you want to do, where you have to select add an outcome under the new comparison, the data type, name, statistical method, the fixed effects, where you select the effect measure, where you choose between odds ratio or risk ratio or risk difference, and then click next, 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 and then you are done. You just have to now enter your data, all right? So the data is also here against the references. This is where I was picking the, the numbers from, right? It, it appears the same way in the in the refman, experimental, the event total. So you just have to follow suit, right? And the refman, it is arranged alphabetically. I did the same thing here. So right, it's pretty easy to follow. So the steps are here. Once you get a document, it's, it's easy to follow. But of course, um, um, the emails of all facilitators are also available. If there are any challenges, I'm sure you can correspond and then um, maybe you can help. Thank you very much. Um, um, thank you. So, uh, Tony, are you going to share the those documents with participants? Uh, I just want to, yes, to find the okay. uh, take of it and then now maybe just uh, close. Um, Yes. So this is what we have done. Just showing you where we left off and then probably what we needed to have added. But most of it has also been covered as part of what David did. So part two over here, we just go through the issues that we need to consider, taking into consideration what meta analysis we talked about is defining each of them, the events and then everything, and then the uh, fixed versus a uh, random effect. Why do you want to choose one of them and what do they mean? And then the yes, fixed effect I've given you, so the, the, the slides probably will come later and you can just uh, go through them. It is simple, the explanation has, uh, explanation has been given. So 
and then you talk with uh, over here random effect model the rest and then over here they pull what he did so when you do fixed effect model we want to talk about the difference that when you use fix or uh, random it doesn't mean the change is not that much but the emphasis is on the on the confidence interval we will have time to explain that look at the uh, random effect the same data look at the width of the overall uh, effect estimate is really wide compared to when you have used the well, when you have used the fixed so random is wide fixed is narrow and then we're going to talk about why and then also why you need to select the model you want to use carefully and then forest plot that is what he has said and this one is explanation about these are the studies lifted over here included these are the intervention they are the intervention so over here so you look at these are the events over the total number because you are using a uh, risk uh, hazard ratio so this is the event over the number for intervention and the same thing over here and this is what you generate but go through over here sometimes you can have a meta analysis in this format this is also a meta analysis you can it is a this one we call the B, the bayesian meta analysis what we are looking at is the frequentist meta analysis the forest plot but you can come to the bayesian meta analysis this is what it does it does and the interpretation is subject to the person who is doing it this is really look at the legend it's explain all everything over here but some people do it and they don't explain it well and it makes it very difficult so normally it has to be thoroughly explained under the legend so these are some of them and this one sometimes you find some heterogeneous um uh, studies and you want to take care of them why don't we just add them and it's telling you why do we have to wait the studies each of them is weighted. The contribution is explained. And why is it that sometimes you have if, uh, the same sample sizes, but sometimes when you do the weighting, one of them is weighted higher than the other. Normally, the weight is a, is a, uh, is a, uh, a composite of the number of events and then the uh, sample. So if the number of events is low, and then your sample okay if to, if you compare it to one of them the, the number of events is lower than the other but the sample size are the same the one with more more events will have higher weighting so these are some of the things that you want to talk about the weighting pooling this is the mean that you talk about and this is what i was talking about the same so these are some of the explanation and heterogeneity how do you do heterogeneity taking into account you have to do um subgroup analysis by don't just lump all of them look at by scientific intuition understanding where you think the heterogeneity is coming from you have a lot of them that we would uh, happen over here when it was lumped there was no difference but when you did subgroup analysis this one there's statistically significant difference in this group and this this one so if you had lumped everything that effect would have been lost so it's very important final plot and those kind of things so that is where we would end today and then next time i think if there's an opportunity we will start something small about on this one before we move on to how to report a meta analysis using the uh, the outline in the cochrane um, software the, the revman so thank you all for your attention Thank you so much, um, Dr. Danso, uh, for this webinar. Uh, we have certainly learned a lot from the practice and also from the demonstration. And as the link will be shared, we can go over and practice more. I think practice will make us perfect to yeah. better understand how to apply the refman. So do we have burning questions for Dr. Danso before we log off at 11? Any burning questions? Okay. So he mentioned that we may have to have another webinar to look at reporting. So um, when the date is set, um, Anna will certainly will share the link, the invites and information on this to all of us across AMIPS, RESPONSE, CORUS, and other uh, research groups that are joining. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on that note, um, we want to thank um, Dr. Uh, Tony and David App. 
Can we all give a thumbs up? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so all the best and definitely we'll meet um, in the next webinar. And we'll share the, the Zoom recording, okay? How do we so get the much. materials? Um, yes, so Anna will share the material. So I'm not sure about the presentation, but the Word documents, Dr. Dan, so that you show Yes, you, you add it to the, the, uh, the package to be shared. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. So um, Tony will send it to Anna and Anna will share to the, the group. Is that okay? Um, but does Anna have, a, does she have our emails? So Anna has just put in her email address in the chat. Uh, please take note of her email address. Okay. If you contact her, she'll do that. But you also will find the recordings on the AMIPS website. I think that link was also shared earlier on. So okay. we are here to put the webinar seven and this eight on the website. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for joining in uh, till the end. And we'll certainly will meet again for webinar nine. Yes. And next time, probably we're going to do it just one hour or one and a half because three hours is really, I can see that most people run away before the three hours. <laughs> and so we, we will have to probably take that one into consideration when we're planning. I think oh. if we're able to give one hour, each time and do series of them it will be better than maybe when we have to give it a long time so that we can accommodate those who don't have time okay. yeah. very useful thoughts yeah so on that note um, thank you and see you again all the best bye thank you bye, bye. thank you once again you're welcome